Welcome to Catholic Views. I'm your host, Renee Kranz. In the studio with me today is Father Scott Trainer back again. Welcome, Father Scott. Thanks, Renee. So great to be here. Yeah, I can't remember. The, it hasn't been that long since you've been here, but long enough. We need to have you on like at least once a month. Awesome. <laughs> I'm there. People are like, yes, please. So as this is airing, it is Easter Sunday. So mm-hmm. happy Easter, everyone. Um, Father Scott is going to talk to us today about the resurrection, which of course is today in the liturgical calendar, and about new life, which is brought about by the resurrection. So he's being so quiet at the moment, but get ready. (laughs) Put your seatbelts on and hang on to your seats. So Father Scott, will you start with first, um, why does the resurrection matter? Because we know it matters. Yeah. But, but <laughs> right. why? It does matter. Like, <laughs> so, for example, the liturgical celebration of the resurrection Easter, yes. right, Easter Sunday, that is such the central event of our salvation mm-hmm. that the church explodes that one calendar day into eight liturgical days. Yes, the octave right. of Easter. It is Easter mm-hmm. day for the next eight days. And then that launches a whole season of celebration of the resurrection. Right. We call the Easter season all the way to Pentecost. Yes. yes. So, yeah, it's important. Leave your Easter decorations up, Leave people. Them up. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So, I mean, there's lots of things to say about that. Like, you know, St. Paul says, um, if Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our preaching is vain and your faith is in vain. Mm-hmm. It doesn't get more blunt than that. Right. So that, that should give us pause. If we're not like, if everyone who's listening or watching isn't just like, oh, yeah, I mean, the resurrection makes all the difference in the world. Mm-hmm. It, that statement from St. Paul gives us pause, right? Like, yeah. oh, maybe there's something more for me to receive. Yeah. yeah. And I want to welcome this awesome gift yeah. uh, more into my life. I so, think we tend to blow by it just because yeah. we see it every year. Yeah. We're like, ah, okay. Really <laughs> so uh, right on, it's super important. And like, why does it make all the difference? Because Jesus Christ risen from the dead has conquered death and robbed it of its power. Right. And death is the greatest calamity that has come to the world. Mm-hmm. Right. So death never had a part in God's creative plan. Right. right. Death came into the world through sin. So, uh, and you know, if, if, if death just has the last word, Mm -hmm. life becomes absurd really quick. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, it's one thing that, uh, if I'm having difficulties or challenges or I'm suffering in life, when we have this sure hope of eternal life that Christ has made possible by his suffering and death and resurrection, Mm -hmm. then there is a foundation of hope. If death just has the last word, like whatever happens in this life happens, and then death, and then that's it. Right. Uh, life becomes just absurd and meaningless mm-hmm. very quickly. So, you know, in the Enlightenment, as philosophy, different philosophies grew up at, in post-Enlightenment, you know, we had nihilism, right? So Nietzsche. Nietzsche is a philosopher who declared God is dead Mm -hmm. and had no belief in the afterlife. And so what are you left with? If death just has last word, you're left with nihilism. Nothing matters. And so how do I go day by day? And his answer was will to power. Mm -hmm. You do what you want, period. And if you just have the will to do it and the courage just to do what you want, that's the best we can hope for in this life. Because this life is all there yeah. is. And it doesn't really matter who's in your way. And that's right. Yeah. That's right. So if some people aren't like died in the wool nihilists like Nietzsche, they mm-hmm. might be just like, well, yeah, you know, I should basically do what I want. And as long as I don't hurt other people. Mm-hmm. But even that, that foundation for morality of what's right and wrong disappears if this life is all there is. Right. Yeah. Right. So uh, death came into the world because of sin. Jesus Christ has conquered sin and death by the glory of his resurrection. And he invites us to share in that victory, Mm -hmm. right? So it's not just that he rose from the dead, but he is to be the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. So the whole theology of baptism is that in the waters of baptism, we enter into the tomb with Christ. We're buried with Christ in his death, a death like his, so that we can share in the victory of his resurrection. Mm -hmm. So we are called to this newness of life that he makes possible by his resurrection. I'm thinking of... um, so a couple thing, more things about that. Yeah. Uh, Jesus, you know, uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, mm-hmm. the one who's seated on the throne, Jesus risen in glory and ascended in heaven, says, behold, I make all things new. Yeah. So for those who are fans of Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, mm-hmm. right, uh, in the artistic uh, beauty of that movie, they take that line from Revelation 21, Jesus in glory, 
and place it as he's fallen for the third time. And Mary, his mother, is in anguish and wanting to go to her son and comfort him. But, you know, like her heart, it's so hard because he, she sees him suffering so much. And she finally gets the courage to come to him. And from, you know, underneath the cross and beaten as he is, he says, uh, behold, mother, behold, I make all things new. Mm-hmm. And like he rises up in that moment. Yeah. And this is a, obviously it's artistic license to take that. <laughs> and you know, move that, it. <laughs> that wasn't in the Gospels. Jesus didn't say right. that during the way of the cross. However, uh, it's so appropriate because Scripture does tell us that Jesus freely laid down his life. No one took it from him. Right. He gave his life out of love for us that we might live forever. Mm-hmm. And may, he may make all things new in that exact way. And uh, that he embraced the cross, despising its shame for the sake of the hope that lay before him. Right. So Jesus uh, trustingly abandons himself to the Father's providence and that trust is vindicated in the glory of the resurrection. Right, right. So the last thing I'd say is, uh, just to start our conversation today, of why is the resurrection important, uh, is because it demonstrates that Jesus is God. Yes, yes. <laughs> This is like really important, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, so some of our listeners might be familiar with um, C.S. Lewis's trilemma, uh, Jesus Christ. Is he the Lord, or is he a liar, or is he a lunatic? Because mm-hmm. Jesus clearly claimed to be God. He took the name of God, I am, mm-hmm. Yahweh. And he applied it to himself. Yeah. And everyone in his day fully understood that's why he was, he, that's what he yeah. was doing. That would have been way more apparent to them than yes. to us. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And that's why they accused him of blasphemy. Right. He's claiming to be God, mm-hmm. clearly and unambiguously. Right. And he's claiming to be God. And he says that he is going to be handed over to the Gentiles and suffer and die, but on the third day, rise again. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, uh, so what's the what are the logical possibilities around such claims? Yeah. One is that he is the Lord. He is God. Yes. He said it and he did it. And in the resurrection, that's what we see. He mm-hmm. is the Lord. Or uh, he thought he was God, uh, but he really wasn't. Right. So he's a <laughs> lunatic. Right. Or he knew he wasn't God, but said he was God. <laughs> so he's a liar. Right. Right. So in that lineup, that logical set of possibilities, what's not possible is that Jesus is just a wise teacher mm-hmm. like you know, Muhammad or uh, Buddha or Martin Luther King or right. whoever, or Oprah, <laughs> is wow. some wisdom figure. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, that we should that we might follow his advice. That's not possible, right? Because if he's a l- liar or a lunatic, you don't follow liars or lunatics right. and like for especially advice on how to, to your death. Life. That's right, as the apostles did. Right yeah. in the most right, the most consequential reality of our lives. Right, and but if he's the Lord, oh then I can place all my trust in his word because God has said it and he will do it. Right. So that Jesus rose from the dead is a vindication of his claims to be God. Mm -hmm. Thanks be to God. Yes. So we have such a great savior and he has the power to make all things new. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, well, so that those are a few points that come to mind when you say, Oh, why is the resurrection important? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So you had mentioned that you have a, you have a, piece from the uh, a homily, an old homily. Oh, here. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you had been reading that uh, earlier, and we were like, oh, my gosh, that's really cool. Uh, I know I'd heard it somewhere before, but you said it's part of the Divine, the divine Office? The Liturgy of the Liturgy Hours. Liturgy of the Hours, yeah, yes. Hours. That's right. That's yeah. right. It's from the Office Readings on Holy Saturday. Yes. So this day where Jesus has died, and he's in the tomb, and he descends into the dead. And this ancient author... If, you, if our listeners, if they Google uh, an ancient homily from Holy Saturday, mm-hmm. they'll probably find this. It yeah. comes up pretty quick. Um, but uh, yeah, so this person is picturing what Jesus, as he goes down into the abode of the dead right. to Sheol, he descended into the dead, uh, as he's addressing Adam and Eve, our first parents, right. so addressing all of humanity. Mm-hmm. And uh, so just listen to this as a, by way of meditation. Jesus says, I am your God, who for your sake have become your son. Out of love for you and your descendants, I now, by my own authority, command all who are held in bondage to come forth so that the dead may rise to life, all who are in darkness to be enlightened, and all who are sleeping to arise. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, with his victory over death, comes with his divine authority to make us sharers in that victory. And so it goes on. I order you, O sleeper, to awake. I did not create you to be held prisoner in hell. Rise from the dead, for I am the life of the dead. Rise up, O work of my hands, you who were created in my image. Rise, let us leave this place. 
For you are in me and I in you. Together we form one person and cannot be separated. That's a beautiful articulation of that. Like we are sharers yes. in Christ's uh, victory over death by virtue of our baptism. And so he doesn't want us to remain in any of the effects of sin. Right. N- neither death, right? He doesn't want us to remain in death, but to rather open for us the gates of eternal life. Nor does he want us to remain in any of the other miseries that came into the world as a consequence of sin. And the idea is if he's conquered even death, he's conquered overwhelmingly all these other forms of suffering. Right. right? So suffering and death were never part of God's creative plan. They all came into the world through sin. Jesus, by his own life, suffering, death, and glorious resurrection, has conquered sin and death and all the other effects of sin as well. Right. Uh, Because every other suffering is just a foretaste of the greatest suffering, which is death. Right. And so uh, Jesus' desire, rise, let us leave this place. So if if I'm carrying, you know, I think of the consequences of original sin. Mm -hmm. Uh, We see Adam and Eve in shame and in self-recrimination and hiding away from God and refusing to admit sin and uh, blaming each other and blaming God and engaged in the spiritual combat and being disrupted in their own relationship with each right. other's husband and wife and things that none of us are ever familiar with. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> wait all of us are totally <laughs> yes. familiar with, right? Those are all a consequence and toil, like work becomes toil, uh, pain is increased, and finally death. Right. right. These are, if you read closely Genesis chapter three, these are the consequences of sin. Well, the love, the redeeming love of Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, has conquered overwhelmingly all those forms of suffering. So Jesus doesn't want us to remain in that place of hellishness ever, right. but by the power of his resurrection to be set free and become a new creation, rise to new life in him. This homily goes on. How did Jesus accomplish this? See on my face the spittle I received in order to restore you to you the life I once breathed into you. See there the marks of the blows I received in order to refashion your warped nature in my image. On my back, I think the scourging. Mm -hmm. uh, See the marks of the scourging I endured to remove the burden of sin that weighs upon your back. So this is like a great meditation. By his stripes, we have been healed. As we read in the letter to the Hebrews. Mm -hmm. By his stripes, we've been healed. See my hands nailed firmly to a tree for you who once wickedly stretched out your hand to a tree in the garden, the forbidden fruit. Right. Um, my side has healed the pain in yours. My sleep will rouse you from your sleep in hell. The sword that pierced me has sheathed the sword that was turned against you, the flaming sword that kept Adam and Eve from the paradise of Eden. Mm -hmm. And then finally this conclusion, rise, as he says, he's in this place of death. Rise, let us leave this place. The enemy led you out of the earthly paradise. I will not restore you to that paradise, but will enthrone you in heaven. I forbade you the tree that was only a symbol of life, but see, I who am life itself am now one with you. I appointed cherubim to guard you as slaves are are guarded, but now I make them worship you as God. The throne formed by cherubim awaits you, its bearers swift and eager. The bridal chamber is adorned. The banquet is ready. The eternal dwelling places are prepared. The treasure houses of all good things lie open. The kingdom of heaven has been prepared for you from all eternity. That's why the resurrection matters. Yeah. That is a generous God right there. Right, yes. That's just the generosity is overwhelming, really. Yeah. It's far beyond anything we can ask or imagine. Yeah. However much any of us thinks that God loves us and believes that, <laughs> Yes, thanks be to God for that faith and belief. But Lord, help my unbelief. Strengthen my faith yeah. in your lavish generosity, the unbelievable expanse and richness of your saving and redeeming love. Yeah, yeah. That was really awesome. <gasps> I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, okay, so new life comes from the resurrection. Amen. So two things. Mm-hmm. Um, what does it mean to have new life? And what does that look like? Like in a regular Catholic's yeah. life, what... Sh- what if we think we have new life, what should we be doing or look like? Yeah. yeah. So there's a couple different ways to answer that. Another big giant yeah, question. I know. For our 20 With minutes five together. minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> One is uh, just to think of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. right? Uh, we have a new life in the Holy Spirit. We're baptized. We come to life in the Holy Spirit by virtue of our baptism and confirmation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the fruits of the Holy Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, gentleness, faithfulness, understanding, and self-control. 
So if I'm entering into this gift of new life today that Jesus offers me in the power of his resurrection, Mm -hmm. more and more those fruits should be characteristic of my day-to-day interactions. Right. So if I have some relationship or some situation in my life where those seem to be absent, I can turn to Jesus Christ risen in glory and say, Lord, bring the light of your glory to shine in this darkness where I'm not at peace, Mm -hmm. where I'm not generous, where I'm finding it difficult to be patient or kind. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. So there's a great exchange that's offered to us. We bring our death. Jesus gives us new life. I can bring my lack of peace and receive peace. I can bring my lack of joy, my sorrow, and trade it in for his joy. Mm -hmm. I can, like, you name it. Yeah. Right? That great exchange to live life in the spirit is available to us every day. Right. Another way to articulate that newness is to read the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew chapter Mm 5 through verses uh, chapter 7, I think, 5, 6, and 7. Uh, when Jesus, and that's where Jesus is like, love your neighbor. Yes. Pray for your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, all the like stuff. all the things, yeah. right? Yeah. And you've heard it that it's said, but I say to you, and he mm-hmm. raises that bar. That's not just a, like a litany of things that we have to try harder to try hard to do because we can't, <laughs> right? <laughs> totally But well, what true. Jesus is describing in the Sermon on the Mount is a life transfigured in the glory of his resurrection. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right? That is the, that's a picture of what new life in Christ right. looks like. Right. So again, wherever I see in my current relationships and circumstances today, if I'm lacking, if I'm not living that way, uh, sorry, I'm looking because our lights are flickering again, like <laughs> when the power went out before. <laughs> if I'm not living that way right now, there's a gift for me to receive from Jesus who's right. risen from the dead. Right. So, it, and it's just that concrete. Like if I'm, if I'm reading those things in scripture, I'm like, oh, well, that doesn't quite that match up with my life today. Yeah. The recourse is to turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, here's how I am, but you call me to this life. Please yeah, do whatever you need to do in me. I'm sorry. I'm turning to you and help me to live this new life by the power of your love and Holy Spirit. So we really just need to be more aware of the things we're doing. And when it's not the right thing, which maybe we need to be, sometimes we need to be formed more to recognize yeah. those things even, mm-hmm. but, <clears throat> and then to actually ask for the things we need. Yeah. Instead of just pretending that God doesn't exist and we're just going to go about our life. That's right. Because we tend to do that. It's easy to bit. do. Yeah. Right, right. Because we live in a world of distractions and things that are clamoring for our attention. Yeah. That are much more immediate, seemingly, to us. Yeah. A simple ma- way maybe to sum that up is, you know, uh, John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, this thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and life to the full. Mm-hmm. And then in John chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus says, I tell you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete, mm-hmm. right? So when I'm like looking in the mirror, brushing my teeth in the morning, if my life seems a little bit more like steal, kill, and destroy, like that's I'm, like, I'm, I'm under the gun, I'm suffering, I'm like, not that we're doing those things. Right. Like, you know, I was like, like wow. I'm getting beat up over here, you know? You know, like life's yes. rough. Yes. And it doesn't Sometimes feel, it, it is. doesn't, right. And it doesn't feel like life and life to the full. That's an indication like, oh, there's something more that Jesus has prepared for me and wants me to receive from him. Right. And so he teaches us to seek and knock and ask right. for that better thing. If I wake up in the morning, I'm brushing my teeth, uh, and I'm not like, oh, the joy of Jesus is in my heart. My joy is complete. <laughs> well, the good news is there's just something more for us to receive from him. Yeah. But it does take that recognition. Yeah. Because if I'm just numb, or if I'm either resigned to that misery, that pain, the shame, the hiding away, the blaming, all the disorder that comes uh, from sin from the beginning uh, in the from original sin mm-hmm. and our own personal sins. If I'm just kind of resigned to that, I don't really think there can be something better or I just be, I become numb to it and I don't even recognize that this isn't the way I wish it were, then we're never going to make that turn to Jesus and ask. Yeah. So it has to be a recognition of our need met with the confidence and hope that Jesus has already met that need by his suffering and death and the glory of his resurrection and desires to uh, bring that gift to bear for me. Yeah. The prologue of the Gospel of John uh, talks about Jesus, the eternal word, who is the light of the world, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome him. Mm-hmm. If I'm experiencing any darkness in my life, again, when I can recognize the darkness as darkness, I can turn to Jesus as the light that even death cannot, like he's, he conquered death. death. Death did not conquer him. Mm-hmm. And I can ask that victory to be brought to bear, that victory to be brought to bear in whatever darkness I'm experiencing today. Right, right. And I think we should remember, too, that although we can turn to Jesus anywhere we are, one of the best places is in the Eucharist. Amen. And go to adoration, mass, whatever. That's right. Places like that. So at every mass. Yes. The whole saving mystery of Christ, mm-hmm. including 
the glory of his resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit poured out at Pentecost is made present and effective for us. Right. At the uh, institutional, at the Last Supper, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. That word is anamnesis, which in English sounds like unamnesia. Oh, right. right. Yep. It's a special spiritual remembering that makes the saving action of God present and effective for us today. So our Jewish brothers and sisters who celebrated Passover this last week, uh, they believe sure. that uh, any Jew who celebrates Passover today becomes a member of the generation of the Exodus by anamnesis. Right, right. right? That this past saving action of God is made present and effective for us today. Mm -hmm. And that's what the church believes in the fulfillment of the Exodus in Christ, who has set us free not just from slavery to freedom, but set us free from sin to uh, righteousness, set us free from death to eternal life, mm -hmm. right? the mm -hmm. greatest Exodus in Passover. Uh, he, th that that saving action of God once for all in Christ is made present and effective for us at every mass. Right. So right. it's a great place to bring the lack of the fullness of life, the lack of joy, the lack of patience, whatever my need is, the mm -hmm. darkness, mm -hmm. and to place that on the altar and receive the power of Christ's saving, redemptive love yep. and the glory of his resurrection be, have that be brought to bear for me today yep. as I go to Mass today. And walk out of there with a ton of joy and yes. hope. Amen. Please. <laughs> Father Scott, we are out of time, uh, I suppose. I know we could talk, we could like literally do this for probably at least another half hour. Well, like the church is going to do it for at least the next 50 days. So. <laughs> That's true. Amen. They have a lot to say about this stuff. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming in. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Renee. You bet. Uh, you can always find us at our website at sfcatholic.org anytime. And uh, just before we go, have a very blessed Easter season. And seriously, leave the Easter de decorations up to remind yourself that Jesus is indeed risen. That's it for us today. Hope you'll join us again next week for more Catholic Views.